Hey, what's up guys and gals? Patrick back with another uh, video on the Waiting Tables Masterclass. And so today we're going to talk about communication and uh, moving on up in the organization. All right, or just moving on up in life uh, in general, period. I'm just trying to get this glare out of the camera. No, okay. So anyways, um, communication. One of the quickest ways uh, to rise as a server is to demonstrate to management as well as your coworkers that you are competent and helpful and um, will help people out when they need it. And so that means being proactive uh, with the help. That means going around on occasion and communicating to other servers that you're available to help them. Hey, do you need anything right now? Can I do anything for you right now? I have some time. Anybody need anything? You know, um, this is just, I think, a good practice if you can and uh, it demonstrates leadership. If a manager sees you doing something like this, you may get better shifts. And um, you'll quickly learn at your restaurant what shifts make the most money, what sections are the best. Don't worry about it too much, but you definitely want to get the best work there, the best nights of the week where they make the most uh, volume of sales. So just keep that in mind. So, how do you move up now that you have all the basics taken care of? Well, you can work on your style with a table, your, uh, your manner. I like to think of uh, an effective waiter style as almost like a late night talk show host. You know, they're not overly good looking usually. Uh, but, the, but they look nice, they're presentable, you know, their clothes look nice, um, you know, they, uh, they talk in a way that's usually pretty, like, hip and cool, but not, they're not trying to be, it's usually sort of based on the sort of witty, funny, cool, intelligence, humor, demeanor, right? So, if you need, if you need to think about what's going to help you talk to your tables in a, in a, in a cool, sophisticated way, so that you're not just coming across as boring, but you know you're enhancing the experience. That's, I think, a late night talk show host. Look up Jimmy Fallon. You know he's a smooth, smooth mofo. Um, Jimmy Kimmel, I think, is one. You know, and I mean, look at their demeanor. You know, you can tell it's like it's like they're confident, they're smart, they're funny, they're cool. But yet, you can still tell that they're not taking everything too serious, right? It's a good sort of demeanor to shoot for. So you help your coworkers. You know, you can ask your manager if they need anything on occasion. Um, as far as the guest goes, it's going to be, uh, you know, every guest is different. Every table is different. Your restaurant is going to want you to present yourself and the menu a certain way the steps of service usually and you have to be careful not to become a robot because after you've been there for a month or two and you have all the basics down you know the menu a little bit you're feeling comfortable that's when your first plateau hits that's when you can get lazy and comfortable because you've attained a basic level of functioning you know or you can try to uh, you know uh, up the ante a little bit and uh, and try to go the extra mile so you want to always be proactive and looking for ways to uh, improve and uh, you can try new things with your spiel is what they call it often your table approach hi hello how's everyone doing tonight you know um, good evening um, how are you Good evening, how are you all tonight? Or good evening, how are you? Or good evening, you know, or good evening, um, how's everyone feeling tonight? Or how's everyone doing tonight? Um, what are we having to drink, you know? 
uh, or you know do your do your spiel. You might have a spiel. They might want you to say certain things, but keep it fresh. Don't get uh, stagnant. Don't turn into a robot. Be thinking of ways to change everything up. Okay. If talking to a table is difficult, because I know for me, it was just like t just talking to people in the beginning was hard for me. You just go up to the table. You don't want to say nothing wrong. You don't want to look stupid. You don't want to look like you're kind of new. Or maybe you don't know what you're doing. So you're afraid to mess up. Maybe you flub words. Maybe you don't open up and sort of demonstrate your, your real ability and smarts and intelligence because you're you know a little concerned or afraid that you're going to mess up or you're nervous. Well, a good way to uh, overcome that is to simply talk to yourself at home. I'm serious. Talk to yourself at home <laughs> about a topic, you know, just start talking about it. Maybe when no one's around, you know, because people might look at you crazy, but uh, I always talk to myself. The more I talk to myself and the more I did YouTube videos, the easier waiting tables became. After that, it was super, it was super easy for me to talk to people because I did a bunch of YouTube videos and those first YouTube videos were quite challenging because I remember my first couple YouTube videos I did, you know, the lighting was bad, the room, uh, you know, the room lighting was, was off. I didn't quite know what to say. I didn't know how to, right now I can kind of speak sort of uh, freestyle. I can kind of um, shoot from the hip, but I also have a page full of notes that I, that I look over uh, a couple of times before I film one of these videos. And I think it's a good habit to get into, you know? And, 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 and you can do that at work as well. Um, you know, you can, uh, before your first table gets there, you can be studying the menu and just be practicing talking about menu items or just, just be talking about menu items in your head. You know? And be thinking of like, oh, you know, just ways to describe ingredients, talk about options, you know, what, what people are enjoying at the restaurant, what's the most popular, or one of the favorites, I don't know, or house staff favorite, I don't know. And and film some YouTube videos, it doesn't matter what you talk about. You can talk about uh, building model airplanes, or uh, makeup tutorials, or something, you know, or uh, anything. But... You know, or you could talk about a topic that you're learning about in school, you know what I'm saying? Because believe it or not, it's just crazy, YouTube. If you film a video about any topic whatsoever other than, uh, like, just turning on the camera and going, oh, like how they do, on, like a lot of people do on Twitter, they just go, <laughs> it doesn't even make sense, they just record themselves, standing there doing nothing, like. But imagine that versus, say, a video where you talk about, I don't know, the War of 1812 in the U.S., which I know very little bit about. But imagine you were studying that in school or college, and you just started, you know, you, you read a bunch of stuff, and you start talking about it, and just relate that to modern-day politics. Force yourself to think and talk on the spot and deform thoughts without a script. At first, it sounds really hard, but I'm telling you, after you get it down to some basics, super easy. And I think making YouTube videos really made uh, talking to tables a lot easier for me because then I could just I don't know I see talking like like you see what I'm doing here and I'm doing and I, I'm keeping I'm keeping the the subject matter flowing if you have a couple of ideas in mind you can just keep going keep talking you know and make sure that you don't fall off track so so that's one way to overcome the fear of, of saying the wrong thing at the table or communicating uh, poorly also a way to demonstrate a little bit of, you know, uh, communication intelligence and, and to wow them a little bit. Also going to help you when you have the big tables with 10 people and you got to kind of take charge and, and, and so that people aren't, you know, distracted and stuff like that and you can get the night moving. So these are some more things that you can, can do to enhance yourself. Another thing is going to be wines. Pick out a couple of great wines. The most popular are usually Cabernet or uh, some type of Chardonnay, right? Um, most of the wine in America comes from California. And there's, uh, I think, five 
major wine producing regions of California. You know, and just knowing a little bit, you know, studying a little bit about American wine and California wine and and just just trying to learn something about it without necessarily uh, thinking you're going to be able to use it. It's going to help you become comfortable with it. And then and then you find a couple bottles of wine or if you can taste a couple or if you find you know find a couple on the menu that are popular and then uh, you know save up some money and if you can you know if you're of age of course then go buy that bottle of wine and try it one night with with some friends or loved ones or just try it on your own and you know do some testing and then and, and you know once you have that intimate knowledge of it and then you know get your senses involved learn a little bit about it study it understand just even the smallest bit about wine then you'll be able to tell your tables like whoa we got this Cabernet Sauvignon it's from um, you know Napa Valley and um, I don't know it's it's not too oaky and it's just it's got a nice body and you know um, it's not too viscous you know nice legs but still and, and has has uh, flavors of strawberry and Coca-Cola. You know, I mean, you say ridiculous shit like that. You think it sounds ridiculous. It does. But people love it. They're going to eat that stuff up. So, trust me. Have a couple of go-to wine uh, wines that you love and menu items. You know, and just be able to talk about it like it's a commercial for Outback Steakhouse or Red Lobster. You know what I mean? So, that's another way to do it. And study that menu, you know. Study it to an extent. It's not a, it's not a memorization thing. It's it's about feeling the, uh, understanding the ingredients and the dishes and being able to project them like a hologram onto the table, so that the table will visualize what you're describing, and then their primal hungers and thirsts will engage and ensure that you um, sell a high ticket. Okay, so we've gone over, um, you know, how to increase your communication ability, how to demonstrate that you're a, a helpful team player, and also how to create a good vibe, um, you know, and, and, and create a leadership reputation. Um, let's see here, what else? Uh, knowing, of course, the menu. Another thing is a foreign language. I, I know uh, a couple of foreign languages. I know um, Spanish, Russian, and now uh, Thai. Uh, at a basic level and so whenever uh, customers would come in who were Spanish or Russian or uh, you know Mexican who spoke Spanish uh, only um, they would give the table to me and I would I would wait on them in, in another language and uh, that can be good um, you don't get too carried away with that um, you don't want to turn the restaurant into a uh, you know I don't know, like some type of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? <laughs> some type of like circus event or, uh, or change or drastically change the, uh, I guess the cultural outlook of the restaurant. And, and, and the reason I say that is because sometimes people who, uh, who speak Spanish, they will attempt to, uh, go out in public and speak Spanish. Like that's all they're going to speak and try to like sort of, um, you know, they do it on purpose, like, to, uh, almost like to try to take over, you know, it's not, there, there is some nefarious motive behind it, it is not, it's not a completely pure and innocent, um, um, motive, but, uh, you know, speaking a, uh, a foreign language can be helpful, and it can also help you, uh, with communicating in general, um, music singing, uh, playing a musical instrument. This is, the, this is the kind of stuff that activates your brain, uh, just as cross training, um, and exercise, uh, gives you benefits when you go back through the exercises. It's like one hand washes the other and each, um, each thing is synergistic and makes you that much better. So speaking of foreign language is good. One, if they can't speak, uh, you know, English or uh, you know the main language um, it's good to help that with that but it's also good for you just because it's gonna make you a better communicator in your native language and in, in English uh, in America uh, or the West wherever you're working 
So it's good to be uh, multilingual. Uh, as far as other communication goes, it's really easy once you get in, uh, you know, the basics and you get adjusted to your restaurant, you feel comfortable, it's easy to stop ironing your clothes. It's easy to let your shoes look bad. It's easy to let leave those stains on your tie because they're small and only you really see them, right? Well, the guest sees them. It's easy to not, uh, you know, bleach uh, your white dress shirts and press them and iron them and, you know, make sure everything is just... You need to act like you're in the military and like this is your dress uniform and you need to take it that seriously. It doesn't even matter if if you're not uh, wearing, you know, fine dining or upscale casual dining attire. It doesn't matter. You need to, you need to look you need to look better than the average person on the street in my opinion in terms of your appearance because you want to represent the restaurant and you also want to raise the bar for the customer or the guest because you want them to feel like they're in Disney World, right? In some fantasy land. Because, again, what is the alternative to eating in a fine dining restaurant if, uh, if, you, if you threw it way to the opposite end of the spectrum? It would be sitting in the woods somewhere, you know, in a loincloth maybe, if you're lucky, over a fire and maybe uh, some animal carcass that you're cooking for dinner and you're going to eat a giant turkey leg or a giant triceratops leg. Because that's what you need to do to survive. So let's make, let's take that eating experience, and let's just, let's just develop it a little bit. And let's turn it into something fancy, nice, memorable, comfortable, sleek, you know, um, hip, innovative, fresh, right? Romantic, sexy, adventurous, exciting, you know, um, suave, sophisticated. So that's what we're doing with all this hospitality stuff. That's what we're doing with this restaurant stuff. We're taking, we're creating a new reality. And you need to think about it like that. Because that's going to help you to master your, your domain of waiting tables. And you don't have to be the best waiter out there. You don't have to be able to carry the most plates. You don't have to be the most charismatic, funniest, best looking, uh, you know, uh, tallest, fittest, um, anything. It's about how you make people feel and it's about the experience that you impart and that you create. And most people don't know the first thing about hospitality or dining. They think they're just going to a restaurant to eat. But you're going to show them just how wrong they are. Okay, but in a good way. And so you're going to you're going to give them a lot to enjoy. Okay, so a couple more things. And this is something that you have to be very careful with when you're moving on up in the world at your restaurant. You're likely going to run into some plateaus, okay? And that is uh, you're going to advance so far, you're going to get you're going to eventually see where they're where they're putting you, what sections, what shifts you're getting, okay? And this is sort of your baseline and you're making so much money and you're getting so many shifts. Some of them are good, some of them are not good. Uh, some of the sections you get are good, some of them are not good. Some of your coworkers are good, some of them are not good. Okay, so what you need to do is recognize when you're in a toxic environment. Um, when basically you've reached a point where you cannot advance any further realistically in an acceptable amount of time. Because you, you might get to a point where you could stay at a restaurant for another couple of years and your current um, shifts you're getting, days you're getting, you know, money you're making, sections you're getting types of customers and guests you're getting, you know, you can stay there for a couple of years and hope for things to improve. That is one thing to do and things certainly can, or you can start looking for other work as well. And one thing I always try to do as a restaurant staff person, uh, employee, whether it was food runner, restaurant server, was I always leveraged my current level of restaurant activity and expertise for a better job. And you have, and I, in my opinion, you have to do this. You don't want to, you don't disregard your primary job, obviously. But while you're at that job, if you feel like you can't move up anymore, because maybe they have lots of great servers, or they have certain servers that seem to always get certain shifts, um, or you have the status quo, right? Things are just the way they are, and they're not going to give you a new opportunity. You're not going to get 
things are just as good as probably as they're going to get, right? You got to be able to recognize that. You got to be able to recognize when something's really awful. You have an awful manager, awful corporate, awful coworkers, uh, something, you know, just terrible, you know, monitor your feelings. And uh, like once I got fired from a restaurant and I thought it was unfair. And then two years later, the restaurant was shut down and they're in a class action lawsuit for not paying employees. So it's not like it wasn't it wasn't all my fault. And they certainly were a bunch of douchebags and I had a bad vibe the whole time I was there. They're just like practically evil, you know, some of the management and corporate. And what do you know? They got shut down. <laughs> so it's not always about you. So recognize a toxic environment, make action, take action to find something better, leverage your current amount of expertise. And then if you go to a new, if, you know, if you go to an interview on an off day, you go to an interview at another restaurant, try to get a better restaurant, a more expensive restaurant. Um, you know, where the, you know, look at the menu, how much is an entree? You know, how much do you think you're going to be able to make from tips on a, on an average night? Considering you get, uh, let's say you get five or six tables, you're going to be able to make a hundred bucks in tips, 200 bucks in tips. What are you looking at? And then when you go in the interview, say, Hey, yeah, I'm working here right now. And I'm doing great, you know, um, but, uh, but I don't know, maybe I, I think maybe I'd like to, uh, do something a little more challenging and, and a little bit more intimately service oriented. I want to, I want to spend more time with the guest enhancing their experience. I, I don't want to, I don't want to be sort of, uh, you know, just a casual server. It's great, but I, I kind of want to, I want to do something more, more exciting, more, uh, more at stake, you know, uh, more luxurious and you know I want to I want to work in a more professional a service oriented environment you know I want to work in a more sophisticated and and uh, you know use whatever words you have to but say you know you want to you want to you want to focus on hospitality and not just you know turn and burn high volume food sales nothing wrong with that but you know, you go to a nice fancy restaurant. And you tell them, "Hey, yeah, I want to want to take care of the guest and spend more time on the table with the guest and work on um, you know upselling and, and features and add-ons and this, that, and the other." And you know, I want and I want to improve. I want to develop as a. You could even say as a professional. I want to develop professionally as a server. I feel like I've gotten all I can uh, professionally from this other job. The money's fine. But uh, I'd like to, I'd like to be more. I'd like to be a, a better server, you know. And if I have to come in here to learn the restaurant as a, as a food runner, when I'm not serving at the other place, I'd be happy to do that if you'll if you'll let me, you know. And then and then and then if and then you get you so now you have another job, you know, and and now you can sort of see, compare the two, and now you can see. Okay, having two jobs is, is very stressful and and hard to manage in the long run, and and one may start to suffer, or they both may start to suffer. So, this should be uh, a careful decision to move in a direction, or to know that it's for a temporary amount of time because you don't want to be working two jobs, three jobs, super long term because you'll get cynical, you'll get burnt out, and then it'll show, and then you won't get ahead anywhere. So know that it's temporary. And uh, it could be your next step to something better. Whereas you're still on good terms with your prior restaurant, and now you're on good terms with your new restaurant. And at any time, you can sit down with either manager and say, "Hey, I need to do this or that. Hey, I've done a lot of thinking. I really appreciate you giving me the opportunity here, but um, I'd like to I'd like to do this or focus on this now so I can do this, and I think I'll be better, and and, and the restaurant will be better off for it." Can we stay in good terms um, in the future and uh, and use each other as a reference or have each other as a reference um, or maybe I can come back um, if you need somebody and, and if it's not what I was hoping it would be, if that's okay. You leave on good terms like that. I see servers, they leave restaurants, they come back all the time. So that's job security expanding your expertise, moving on up in the world, and doing so in a way that maximizes your time, resources, and your already acquired skills. And it's, exe it's the exact path I used to get up into a uh, restaurant companies. Okay, you go in, 
you want to be a server, but you're willing to do other stuff. And eventually, you're mostly a server, you know? And eventually, you're only a server. Or eventually, you've worked enough server shifts and runner shifts at the same time that you can take that experience to a new restaurant and they'll say, oh, well, that's great, good experience. You're a little bit of a rookie. Uh, you're a little bit uh, new as far of, uh, as a server goes, but you know, we'll take a chance on someone who's hustling and working hard over one of our entitled scumbag servers who's been here a long ass time and isn't really doing shit with their life. <laughs> okay. All right, well, I hope you enjoyed this video and that it was helpful for you, you know, mastering communication um and then and then uh you know how your community how your restaurant communicates with you and to you what your future will be is gonna help you um plan your career and your next move and remember where you are right now is most important so focus on that and don't wear yourself thin but always be looking for how you can advance um yourself as well as advancing the guest because let's say you worked at Chili's for a year or two, right? Don't you think that if you took all the good experience and none of the bad habits from Chili's and then you went to say Ruth Chris Steakhouse, which is extremely more expensive, maybe maybe you're not the master of fine dining yet, but you have such a great basis for guest service that you'll pick up the uh, nuances and the finer aspects of uh, upscale dining. So stick with it always challenge yourself look to improve you know even getting a job another job outside of serving can can also give you a good perspective and additional skills so just about everywhere i served people had another job a hustle a small business or an aspiration so absolutely a good thing to have all right i wish you well i hope this video is helpful i'll see you on the next one take care